69, I believe, is where we were going to go. Yeah. Three sixty nine. Okay, I don't You'd be you'd be absolutely right. Okay. Because I didn't know if I really did. Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to the church tonight. Thank you so much for being here with us. Our young people are out caroling tonight, so we won't just give them uh, a word of uh, prayer and hope that the Lord would just use them in this uh, this time. So let's go to the Lord in a word of prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, God, that you've given us this day to be uh, assembled here in your house. And we ask now, Heavenly Father, that you'd be with us as we go through the furtherance of this service. We pray that you'd be with our young people, dear Lord, as they try to minister to those that would listen, dear Lord, about the good news of the birth of Jesus Christ. And we ask now, dear Father, that you'd Bless here in the service here at the church, and you'd use our pastor for just a little while as he administered to us, dear Lord, and you'll use these songs of Zion, dear Lord, that it might uplift your name, for you're worthy of all praise. We give you all the praise for everything. In Jesus' name we do pray. Amen. Amen. If you will, turn over to page number 369. 369. That's awesome. page number six and sing this child of the king tonight.
but there's something about that name. Uh, I was thinking about this Christmas and this Christmas season uh, as I was coming into the service tonight. And, uh, you know, this is all about the person of Jesus Christ right there. This is his celebration. It is about who he is and what it, what it should mean to each and every each and every person on earth actually is what it should mean. But you know, we uh, we hear his name and we uh, we believe in him. Even as Christians, we believe in him right there. But we don't really understand the power of that name right there. How it can heal the sick. It can even raise the dead at the name of Jesus right there. Just those 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 how great and how marvelous it is to be associated to that name right there. You hear all this rhetoric and stuff that goes on on, on the news about all these famous people and stuff and their relationships with people. But my greatest relationship is when I met Jesus Christ right down here at Good News Baptist Church, September 11, 1988. I come to know Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. And I'm glad when I get the opportunity to share that with people to tell them of the man that I've seen by faith right there. One of these days, face to face, I'm going to see him. I'm going to look at him. He's probably going to have the nails in his hands right there, the ribbon side right there. But he, I believe he's going to look at me and he's going to hug my neck. He's going to say, welcome home, my son. So I'm glad to be able to sing this tonight. Let's sing it together. There's just something about that name. I'd like to welcome those that joined us online. Appreciate each and every one of them, and those that are here in the church. We do appreciate you being here with us today. I do want to remind you that we will have a Sunday morning service at 11 o'clock here in the church. So we'd like to 
Uh, just invite all that will come. If you're watching online and you're here in the area, we'd love to have you here at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, and we'll just uh, have, a, have a time together in celebrating the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, is there anything else we can help you with tonight? Any kind of prayer request? Anyone? All minds and hearts clear. understand that Miss Dolly's home, and I understand that Mr. Raymond done well in his surgery right there, so that's good good news right there. Anything else? We told maybe tomorrow or the next day, see where Sandra could tell us whatever, but uh, Raymond could come home. Oh, so it'd be yeah. good to pray that he get home before he got rid of the cold. That would be a lot <laughs> easier on him and, and uh, his family getting home. Appreciate you praying for Cindy. She's been doing really Ms. Glenda, won't you just thank the Lord for answering all these prayers for us? Someone else. I'm ready for everybody to get well and just come back to church. <laughs> I tell you, there's a lot, lot of needs out there today. So uh, do be much in prayer for all uh, that are going to be out in the cold, and uh, a lot of workers have to be out there. So uh, just just keep them in your prayers as uh, this blast kind of moves through this weekend. Hopefully uh, it being a holiday weekend, maybe they won't have to be out there so much. I do know that uh, Brother Josh and them are going to be on call for that. So uh, just remember, remember all of our all of our church family. Anything else? Yeah. Okay. 
Heavenly Father, we just want to thank you, God, that you've given us another day, and thank you, dear Lord, that you're doing a great work in each and every one of our people's lives, dear Lord. And we pray not only for our church, but for all of our churches around, dear Lord. I'm sure they are facing many of the same afflictions of the body, dear Lord, and we pray, dear Lord, for those that might be just uh, kind of broken and downhearted, dear Lord, during this time and season, dear Lord, maybe even facing some depression. We pray, dear God, that you would be their comforter and you would be their counselor, for you are our mighty God, and we're just trusting you, dear Lord, to meet in, uh, uh, each and every need. We ask now, dear Father, that you'll be with the pastor as he comes around. May you help him in the ministering uh, to us, dear Lord to guide him, dear Lord, and to give him the words, dear Lord, that's going to be most effective to each and every one of us, dear Lord. And Father, we pray for those that have are watching us online and have been watching us online for some time. We ask, dear God, that you would bless their homes and their families. For whatever reason, they're unable to be here with us, dear Lord. I pray, dear God, that you would just uh, reach out to them, dear Lord, and for those that are in great distances like our our daughter Jenny, dear Lord, and her husband Dan, we pray, dear Father, that you be with them, dear Lord, as they too will be in the lines of these storms that's coming about. We ask now, dear God, that you would uh, bless in the furtherance of this service, and we'll give you all the praise for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, Pastor. It happened one day near December's end. Two neighbors called on an old-time friend, and they found his shop so meager and mean, made gay with a thousand boughs of green. And Conrad was sitting with face a shine when he suddenly stopped as he stitched the twine, and he said, "Old friends, at dawn today, when the cock was a crowing the night away." The Lord appeared in a dream to me and said, I'm coming your guest to be. So I've been busy with feet of stir, strewing my shop with branches of fir. The table is spread and the kittle is shine, and over the rafters the holly is twined. And now I'll wait for my Lord to appear and listen closely so I will hear his step as he nears my humble place. And I opened the door and look on his face. So his friends went home and left Conrad alone. For this was the happiest day he had known. For long since his family had passed away. And Conrad had spent many a sad Christmas day. But he knew with the Lord as his Christmas guest, this Christmas would be the dearest and best. So he listened with only joy in his heart. And with every sound, he would rise with a start and look for the Lord to be at his door, like the vision he had a few hours before. So he ran to the window after hearing a sound, but all he could see on the snow-covered ground was a shabby beggar whose shoes were torn and all of his clothes were ragged and worn. But Conrad was touched and he went to the door and he said, your feet must be frozen and sore. I have some shoes in my shop for you and a coat that'll keep you warmer too. So with grateful heart, the man went away. 
But Conrad noticed the time of day And he wondered what made the dear Lord so late And, and how much longer he'd have to wait When he heard a knock, he ran to the door But it was only a stranger once more A bent old lady with a shawl of black And a bundle of kindling piled on her back She asked for only a place to rest but that was reserved for Conrad's great guest. But her voice seemed to plead, Don't send me away. Let me rest for a while on Christmas Day. So Conrad brewed her a steaming cup and told her to sit at the table and sup. But after she left, he was filled with dismay, for he saw that the hours were slipping away and the Lord hadn't come as he said he would. And Conrad felt sure he had misunderstood. When out of the stillness, he heard a cry. Please help me and tell me where am I? So again he opened his friendly door and stood disappointed as twice before. It was only a child who had wandered away and was lost from her family on Christmas Day. Again, Conrad's heart was heavy and sad. But he knew that he could make the little girl glad, so he called her in and wiped her tears and quieted all her childish fear. Then he led her back to her home once more. But as he entered his own darkened door, he knew that the Lord was not coming today. For the hours of Christmas had passed away. So he went to his room and he knelt down to pray. And he said, Lord, why did you delay? What kept you from coming to call on me? For I wanted so much your face to see. When soft in the silence a voice he heard, Lift up your head, for I kept my word. Three times my shadow crossed your floor. Three times I came to your lowly door. For I was the beggar with bruised cold feet. I was the woman you gave something to eat And I was the child on the homeless street Three times I knocked, three times I came in And each time I found the warmth of a friend Of all the gifts, love is the best I was honored to be your Christmas guest patients would tell them, some of them would tell them that, that Christmas time was almost more than they could handle because they felt lonely, they were by themselves, they were isolated. I know it's, as many of you know, it's the number one time of year for suicide. And I thought how awful it is that there's such a, an attitude and an atmosphere toward this time of year when essence what God was doing when he sent his son was to let you and I know that we are absolutely never alone. There's an old uh, hymn of the church and that's the name of it, Never Alone. Sometime we need a human touch, sometime we need a real voice to speak back to us. Sometimes we just need to see somebody. I've had health care workers talk about how this time of year, especially among elderly people, that they've had them to purposely try to get into the hospital. And ambulance drivers, paramedics has talked about how they would be called to their house 
you know, on Christmas Eve a lot of times, and really there wouldn't be much wrong with them, but they tried to do that so they wouldn't be by themselves, for they'd be around somebody. If you turn with me real quickly to the Christmas story in Luke, chapter number two, obviously, and we won't read this whole segment and passage, but we'll probably start about verse eight. And it's mainly verse 14 that I want to focus on for a few minutes. I want to talk to you tonight for a few minutes about the source of real peace. There's also another old song that says, The only real peace that I have, dear Lord, is in you. Many of you have heard that song. Peace, according to the world, is the absence of war or conflict. That is, that is a definition of peace, obviously. But peace in the Bible is not just feeling better about ourselves or others or conditions, situations, or issues. It's not just getting it to a point where something doesn't bother us anymore. That's not what peace in the Bible actually means. And certainly we couldn't try to use all the verses. I've got a few reference verses tonight of peace in the Bible um, it would it, we'd, we'd be here till daylight. The Bible has a lot to say about peace. Peace, according to Webster's 28 dictionary, and I like that one because in that volume, even though it's an 1828 dictionary, uh, a lot of references are used to Scripture. But Webster said. In gen it's a, in general a sense or a state of quiet tranquility, freedom from disturbance or agitation, applicable to, so to society, to individuals, or to the temper of mind. Freedom from agitation or of disturbance by the passions as from fear, terror, anger, anxiety, or the like, Quietness of mind, tranquility, calmness, quiet, quietness of conscience. And he gives a reference to 119, 165. Most of y'all probably quote that verse, Great peace have they that love thy law, and nothing shall offend them. Webster is saying that when a person has the kind of peace that the Bible's intending and describing, that all of that is centered on the fellowship they have with God, the relationship that they have with God. He goes on to give another reference of, or a definition, rather, of peace. He calls it heavenly rest, the happiness of heaven, harmony, concord, a state of reconciliation between parties at variance. A good example of this is 1 Timothy 2.5. He said, for there is one God... There is one God, you got to keep in mind that verse don't work at all unless you read that first part. There is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Just one. Verse number 8 of Luke 2, it said, And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore, very afraid. And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. Aren't you so thankful for that little word, all? For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. And this shall be a sign unto you, ye shall find a babe wrapped in swaddling clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. To look at the Bible's examples of peace, knowing that the scripture, that I will not use that passage, it's from Isaiah chapter 9, but in Isaiah chapter 9, the Bible calls him the Prince of Peace as one of his names, as wonderful counselor, the mighty God, the Prince of Peace. In other words, he oversees that, he enforces that. Uh, he is the one who has made it possible. Acts twenty four sixteen. 
Luke writes this, And herein do I exercise myself to have always a conscience void of offense toward God and toward men. Talking about that peace. That by, and peace in the Bible actually means fellowship and a clear conscience toward God. 2 Corinthians 1.12, For our, result, our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you word. In other words, you know the Corinthians knew this better than anyone. Isaiah 26, 12, <clears throat> Lord, thou wilt ordain peace for us, for thou also hath wrought or fashioned all our works, all our works in us. Isaiah 26, 3, Thou wilt keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed upon thee. Ephesians 2, 15, Having abolished in his flesh the enmity, the separation, even the law of commandments contained in ordinances, for to make in himself of twain one new man, <clears throat> so making peace. Romans 5, 1, you know very well, therefore being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. All keeps coming back to him, doesn't it? All keeps coming back to Christ. Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7, uh, Paul relates how important it is uh, that Christ did come and uh, that you and I now have this opportunity and this um, provision of peace. You'll notice he said, but when the fullness of time, of the time, notice that word the, I better not leave that out or it won't work, was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law, he said to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons or be put back into the position. And because you are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts crying, Abba, Father. Wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. There it is again. All the way back to Christ. If you look at verse 14 for a moment, You'll notice he begins that by saying glory to God in the highest. And I want you to notice the little word and. How many knows as we talked about, <clears throat> excuse me, Sunday from 2 Timothy 3.16 that all scripture is given by inspiration of God. And so that little word and is in there for a, you know, for a reason. As a matter of fact, it's a big word in that little verse. It's a transitional word. You'll notice glory to God in the highest. Wouldn't it be awesome if that was taking place on earth? Glory to God in the highest. Wouldn't that be awesome if that was every church service, if that was every time you and I prayed, if that was every time we entered our quiet time and we read scripture, every time we interacted with someone on the Lord's behalf? <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome if our young folks were experiencing that tonight out uh, with the people that they're trying to encourage and sing to? That'd be awesome, wouldn't it? Glory to God in the highest. But it doesn't really happen on earth much, does it? Matter of fact, it's not an earthly happening here. He's not talking about it happening on earth here. Notice the little word and. What's he talking about? It was described to us in verse 13. And suddenly there was with the angels a multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, glory to God in the highest. That was going on in heaven. That was a heavenly celebration that he's recording here. That's something that's happening in God's very presence. I tell you, some good food for study, or from good, or, or some good uh, uh, basis for study right here, is that and multitude of the heavenly host. Some likes to say, "Well, that's our that's our loved ones that have gone on and departed." Really? According to the scripture, they weren't there yet. <laughs> They're in a place called paradise. <laughs> I, I'm going to confuse you, I guess. I don't mean to. But you read about that in Ephesians chapter number four. He that descended, he that ascended first descended. You read about it in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where, or, or Matthew's gospel, where when he arose from the dead, there was, they was people that arose with him. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12, you read about where 
Paul went to that third heaven and he saw things that he couldn't describe. Uh, but now those that were in paradise are no longer there. They're, Christ has taken them to heaven. Christ hadn't went to heaven yet. John 14 hadn't took place yet. He hadn't died yet. Who's this heavenly host he's talking about here? You say it's the Old Testament saints. No, according to them, they're in Abraham. According to the Bible, they're in Abraham's bosom. <laughs> That'd be some good study, wouldn't it? <laughs> that heavenly host. But, I, but what we need to get out of this is there's a celebration taking place in heaven. That's what's happening. It's happening in heaven. Why is that? Because what man couldn't do for himself, what angels all throughout the Old Testament hadn't been able to do for man, what God giving the law and the instruction, what Abraham's faith hadn't got done yet, man had not been redeemed yet. So heaven is celebrating because God himself is coming down here to do something about it. Isn't that awesome? No wonder heaven is celebrating. Notice the little term right there, and. Glory to God in the highest. That's what's going on in heaven. But now we're talking about what's happening here on earth. And on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. You got to understand tonight that nobody really felt too much peace living under the law. Nobody had too much confidence. Nobody had too much security living under the law. The Bible tells us over and over and over, one of the greatest, most prolific Bible writers, St. Paul himself, kept reiterating over and over and over. And he said in, he said in Philippians chapter 3 that he was void of offense concerning the law. What did that mean? That meant that outwardly he looked real good. Outwardly he had kept the rules. Outwardly nobody could point a finger at him and say, you failed in this. But he said then in Romans chapter number 7, inwardly he was a miserable failure. He had failed miserably. He knew exactly what covetous was. The law had convicted him. Outwardly he kept the rules. He looked good. Boy, a lot of folks are the same way today, aren't they? Look real good outwardly. But inwardly is the problem. Jesus told those Pharisees that never miss paying their tithes that never miss the temple, they never miss quoting scripture, they never miss praying in public, they never miss looking holy any time you've seen them. You know what Jesus said? He said, you're like a good clean grave. You're like whited sepulchers. He said, outwardly, you're cleaned up real nice, and then he said, inside, you dead. you full of dead men's bones. He said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter in. These real religious, ultra-religious people wasn't going to heaven. Isn't that something? Had a funeral not long ago. By the way, I've had a funeral every week uh, through December. Hopefully this week will be different. I hope folks get to stay longer. But not complaining about those things. But I had one not too long ago. And it was obvious to me that those folks were caught up in works. And when we talked about, talked about going to heaven, that kind of thing, they were relating that to works. Well, works matter, but works, as you obviously know, and I know you agree, don't get us to heaven. Those Pharisees' works were impeccable. And back to our verse, that peace was hard to come by under the law. Not too many people had that under the law. And so um, uh, when, when the scripture is saying here on earth, he's talking about something taking place here that had never taken place before, that there was going to exist a peace between God and man. The last time peace existed between God and man, it was none other than Abraham, the father of our faith. That was the last person that really enjoyed that kind of confidence and that kind of security. And you know that Abraham was not perfect. You read in your Bible where he failed on, on, on a number of occasions. You read in your Bible where even though he was a person of faith, it didn't seem like that faith was showing up too well. But yet, God honored his faith. Look at Samson. Could there have been a person that failed worse than Samson? But yet, God honored, number one, his word. You know, some would say, well, God honored Samson's faith. Well, Samson had God's word before he had any faith. 
And so God honored his word. And then Samson just simply relied on that word. But he kept failing miserably. And so not too many people had that real deep peace that you and I can experience because we know the Lord today. Not too many people had that. As a matter of fact, uh, he has taken this into, a, into uncharted waters here uh, when he talks about peace on earth. He's talking about something that was never possible before. Think about what he is saying here. Let me reiterate Isaiah seven fourteen. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. We talked about that Sunday, but what I want to add here is Emmanuel, which is what? Yeah, God with us. That's why heaven was celebrating here, because God's coming. God's with us. God's able to do this. How many's ever heard the story about the fellow trying to get birds in his barn? You ever heard that story about that guy, you know, the birds hit his window and it was cold and snowing out there, and uh, his wife had tried to get him to go to church and all that, and he wouldn't ever go to church with her, and he didn't, you know, put too much uh, stock or too much, uh, you know, value on what she, her faith, and her talking about Christ becoming a man and coming here and all that. And so one day to those birds hit his window, and he thought to himself, if I could get those birds to go in the barn, I'd get them out of the wind, get them out of that snow, get them out of the weather, them flying around out there. And so he went out there, and he tried to get them to go in the barn, and and they just kept flying around in the yard, wouldn't go. So he went, and he thought, well, it's the lights in the house. It, you know, drew them to, that, to the window. So he went out there, and he lit him a, a lantern, and he put it out in his barn, and he tried. He thought, well, that'll, that'll get them. That, that light will draw them. And they still never would do it. And so he struggled with that for about 45 minutes. And so finally, he just thought to himself, well, what in the world? What can I do? If only I was a bird, they'd follow me in. And all of a sudden... It dawned on him that Christ became a man, that he came down and he was the example that you and I certainly could follow. So heaven was celebrating because Emmanuel, God himself, had came to the earth. He was joining the human race. And so you'll notice the latter part of that in closing. He said goodwill toward men. Goodwill toward men. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. Boy, you can't get a better description of goodwill toward men than that, can you? That God would go to such great lengths. That's what Christmas time is all about. It's too bad that you and I tonight, and I appreciate what the young folks are doing. I hope that they, I hope they can contact a few lonely folks. <laughs> I hope that they can encourage everybody that they go to see. I realize they just got a short time to do it, so they can't go to a lot of places. But I just trust the Lord will use them, and the Lord will use you and me. Oh, if he puts somebody on your heart, won't you call them? If he puts somebody on your heart and you had a minute, why don't you... Stop by if you can. Somehow or another, make contact with them. Somehow or another, let them know that you're thinking about them, that they matter this Christmas. You might say, well, I don't know anybody like that. Well, I'm glad that you don't, but there are people out there like that. And God's goodwill toward men and doing all that he did, wouldn't it be awesome today if people could just understand that? That God's will toward men is good. <laughs> yeah, break those words up a little bit. God's will toward men is good. Most people look at the things of God as a bunch of rules, regulations, that if they don't keep them, that God is just dooming them to torment, that he's ready and willing and waiting just to judge them. He's ready to get back at them for all the bad things they've done, all the mistakes they've made, all the neglect that they've shown toward him, that he's ready to get back at them for that. And nothing could be further from the truth. And so during Christmas time, like I said, I believe there's always somebody to bless. There's always something good. But of course, it's not just at Christmas. It's any time. And can I just um, 
the very last thing here. There's an obscure verse as I was doing my preparation to come tonight and share this with you. There was an obscure verse, and or it's obscure to me, in Ezekiel 34. And it talks about the practicality of peace. How many knows that the Bible is a very practical book? It's very practical. I mean, the Lord intends for you and I to apply this every day. He intends that you and I, if we need answers, we can find them right here. He, he's got it set up so you and I can use this as a guide. You remember the old song? I don't know why I keep quoting so many old songs tonight. The old bluegrass song, using my Bible for a roadmap. <laughs> he intends for it to be that way, that you and I can use it that way. Nathan's got it up there because I gave it to him, but notice what that verse says. I will make them a covenant of peace, he said. And will cause the evil beast to cease out of the land. Now that evil beast, he's, this in context of this, is talking about wild animals that would attack somebody and bring injury to them. But you can also, you can also relate that to a little bit further uh, to demonic activity. Anytime you see the word evil in your Bible, you can't. It has a reference also to demonic activity. But it looks. It said. And they shall, <laughs> look what he said there. He said, he's going to cause the evil beast to cease out of the land and they shall dwell safely in the wilderness. Notice that last part. <laughs> and sleep in the woods. I think if I ever go camping again in a tent, I'm going to put that on my tent, I think. I'm going to hang that verse out there. <laughs> That's a good blessing, isn't it? That's awesome, isn't it? And I, what's he saying in that? He's saying that my peace the covenant of peace I make with the people who trust and believe in me and who will allow me, listen, they hit my place in their life. He said, that peace, he said, I am fixing it. I'm fixing it where they're safe regardless of where they're at. That's what he's saying. Sleep in the woods. You notice the word wilderness and woods. You got to relate them to. And, and Christ himself, Christ modeled that. Matthew 4 and Luke 4, he modeled that. Matter of fact, the scripture said he was in that wilderness for 40 days. That's something not eating. Over there being tempted of the devil, not a demon. No, but the devil himself. I don't know about you, I don't think I've ever been tempted to the devil himself. I don't think so. Even St. Paul wasn't. According to, according to 2 Corinthians 12, he wasn't either. Not of the devil himself. As I've said before, I think you and I like Paul. I think the, the Bible precedent is that uh, the devil assigns one of his demons and imps to us to hinder and, and to, uh, to battle us. I believe he does. But uh, that's why you and I can be troubled at the same time of something we know that's and sense that it's a spiritual, has spiritual nature and a demonic attack about it. But he's saying in that little obscure verse there that he's saying my peace works. In the wilderness, Christ was in that wilderness being tempted of the devil and the Lord's peace worked. He kept using scripture over and over and over, didn't he? Over and over and over. Just keep in mind what a blessed time that we're living in. What a day that we're living in that we could spread and share the goodness of God. Usually at Christmas time, people's hearts are a little softer and their attitudes are a little better. Maybe not always, but usually it is. And I would that we could use that to our advantage to spread the good news of the gospel. To let people know that as the old mantra, Jesus truly is the reason for the season. If you'll bow your heads with me tonight. Father, we are very thankful to be able to come here. And Father, share some good news from your word with the folks who would listen. We do thank you for those who watched us. And Father, we are thankful, Lord, that all the good things you do, that you've done, uh, Lord, that we might have the benefit of those things. And you came and gave your life, Father. You did that for us. Lord, we could have just kept living under the law. But Father, according to Scripture, and as we as we see it clearly defined, Father, it's a, it's a, a New Testament keeps calling it a mystery. It was all a mystery in the Old Testament how you would actually come yourself, how you would come in the person of Jesus Christ. 
and how you would give yourself a sacrifice and end all the sacrificial system and satisfy God's requirements throughout all eternity. And that after that, that you, Father, would rise from the dead and according to Hebrews, that you would enforce your will and testament and you would oversee it personally yourself as a representation in the throne room before Almighty God as an advocate to all those who believe. And then, Father, you would send the Holy Spirit that he would take up his place inside of us. And that, Father, we, would, we couldn't get any closer to God than the Holy Spirit inside of us. Oh, we can learn, Father, we can understand, dear God, we, uh, Lord, need to understand your closeness to us and take advantage of it. Because, Father, certainly there's, there, there's growth for us to grow in that relationship. But as far as that relationship and that, and that initial, uh, Father, in that initial acceptance, Lord, you're, <laughs> you're close, you're here, you're on the inside. And Father, you was willing to come from the throne room of heaven to a, 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 a cow stable or a, or a little cave, a stall, Lord, where animals were kept. And the greatest king of glory would be laid in a, in a manger, in a cow feeder. And dear Father, I appreciate you coming to such humble means. That Father, not just the rich folks, but all people could relate to you. Aspects of your life that every person could relate to. To those, Father, who've been brought up proper and... and uh, uh, Lord and and uh, uh, and Priam and very well, uh, very well uh, supplied to those heavenly Father that was born into illegitimacy and uh, Lord the the uh, world around them looked upon them. Uh, Father is a curse, dear Father. Anybody, regardless of their condition, I would somebody tonight, Father, this may be lonely, that maybe Father is thinking that if that person just hadn't left or if that person hadn't passed away or a father, if they would have been treated better by their family, or whatever excuse they're, they're coming to. Somebody had just kept the word. Help them to understand, Father, a little video we watch. You keep your word. And Father, help them to understand that you've never failed, you've never fallen short, and that they can trust in you. And whatever their needs are, Father, you'll meet those needs. If they need someone to come by and say hello, the Holy Spirit can do that. If they need someone, Father, uh, to, to come by and give them a hug, just a handshake, whatever it is, the Holy Spirit can do all of those things. And Father, as Isaiah said, after he pronounced all those woes on the people around him, then he got there to chapter 6 and saw your, uh, you and your glory, saw the, saw the train of the Lord fill the temple, then he said, woe is me. He understood. He said, I'm a man of unclean lips. I'm undone. I was in a place where I could look on others' sin. Now I can see my own. Now I understand my need for the relationship of a relationship with that great king. And after he came to that place, Father, then he said, here am I, send me. And so, Father, here am I. Send me. Help us, Father to be that blessing. Bless your people as they try to bless others. Keep our young folks safe tonight, Father, and may they come back with the joy of the Lord in their heart, feeling blessed because they blessed others. And Dear Father, may you do a great work among you people. I realize not everybody can come back Sunday. I pray you bless their Christmas. I pray their family be well. I pray their travels be safe. I pray, Father, that uh, every place they go, they'll be able to enjoy it. And so, Father, we're just trusting, Lord, that you'll cause us to look unto you, the one that's wrote it and the one that's authored it and finished our faith. We praise you and thank you for that. May souls be saved in this place. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Any last word tonight from anybody? Thank you for being here. Merry Christmas. Hope everything goes really good. All your family's well and you... Really enjoy making your rounds this year. You're at liberty to go. Mr. Wayne, appreciate you being here.